A uh, little bit about me, my background. I um, basically invest in things that if I tell you what they are at a cocktail party, you walk away. I like things that are logistics, that are hard problems to solve. And what I wanted to do today is we hear a lot from founders, very technical founders that talk about the nitty gritty of things. I'm an investor. I've been involved in seed investing, angel investing, VC investing in the Valley for three decades. I came to Bitcoin 10 years ago. So what took me a long time to learn were some, some elements and I just wanted to tease out and if I could in the next 10 minutes, distill 10 years of Bitcoin knowledge and 30 years of VC knowledge. So let's see how that goes. So hit it. I like big butts. So this was going to hit the title of that thing because this is really what we're talking about. All right, that's good, that's good. Um, so, so when we talk about big blocks, why does it matter? Everybody's talking about the block wars and the fights that have happened. What, what does it matter? Like, who cares, right? So that's the, this is the most important question, I think. So why does it matter? So when most people, especially not to harp on New York, but most investors, New Yorkers, investors, the investor types, the first thing when they see Bitcoin, they think of this. Is it fiat currency? Is it a stable coin? Is it a replacement for the dollar? Is it a special reserve? Or they think this, can I trade on it? How do I make money? Can I do arbitrage? Can I, is, is it money? Is it a trading vehicle? Is it an ETF? Is it a stock? How do I make money? And I think fundamentally a little tongue in cheek risk management, you saw that uh, FTX just sued SBF's parents today. Um, the problem with this approach towards Bitcoin is fundamentally what Bitcoin is, is a, a network. It's, it's a software network and there are network effects to it. And it took me three years to learn this. And, and Kurt went over this before, but I think it's really important. This first sentence, a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. That to me is the most important sentence of the white paper. We've lost track of that. Everybody talks about digital gold. Everybody talks about all of these different things that we've been discussing. But really, what is Bitcoin fundamentally? It's a database or a ledger, if you like. It's, it's immutable. It's data stored in a row and a column, just like a, I worked at Oracle. I sold enterprise software for Oracle for years. Uh, a ledger is almost more apropos because it's written, and if it's crossed out in pen, you can see that. That's what they mean by immutable. This is all it is. It's a database. So why, who cares? What makes it so special? If you use Oracle, excuse me, if you use Oracle, that can change and you might know it, but it's private to that company and you have to pay them for that. All of the blockchains that were, the BSV blockchain that we're talking about is public. So anybody can see it. And if it's changed, everybody knows it. That's why things like Unisot work because it's, it's baked into that supply chain. And in, in this, the, the, don't worry, I'm not going to go into this. I couldn't write a line of code if you gave me, you know, 24 hours. Um, but I think this is really important. So when people talk about what is a block, this is what a block is. So this Genesis block is the first block that was ever created. The first block here, block one, all it really is, is that it's a block number. It's got some header information. It's got a timestamp, which is the day, second, et cetera. So it, it tells you when something happened. And then a nonce, which is basically just a number that's used once. It's the number that's solved for by the miners to create, to, to get the block written into the blockchain. And then below that, we've got transactions, and I'll get to that in a minute. But once you connect these things with the hashing, it becomes a long chain. That's why it's called a blockchain. So this is another piece. When I say the word transaction, most people think credit card transaction. You swipe something, it's a transaction. But in the context of a blockchain, a transaction can be anything. It can be data, an audio file, a movie, it can be anything. So when you talk about a big block versus a small block, BTC does three to five a second, and every block is mined about every 10 minutes, that's 3,500 transactions. If you can do terabytes or a million and a half transactions per block, it becomes really important for the following reason. This chart on the left-hand side is, there's only two ways that miners make money. Miners make money by mining blocks, or they make money by getting paid for the transactions within that block. So as you can see on the right-hand side, it's called the halvening. Every four years, there's 21 million Bitcoins. Every four years, it's halved. So when a miner solves for a block today, 
they get 6.25 BTC. That's going to be 3.125 next year in 24. So if you're getting fewer and fewer Bitcoins and the price of Bitcoin doesn't double, you're, you're losing average money per for the miner, which brings me to the left side of this chart. It was always intended, as the white paper said in the beginning when I just read that, is that it was intended to be a peer-to-peer -peer transaction electronic hash network. So if you have a three and a half million transactions in a block, there's value there. If you have a 3,500 transaction in a block, there's less value there. Miners are what secure the network. In order for this public blockchain to be open and accessible and immutable, it needs to be secure. And so when Kurt talks about you know, using a Raspberry Pi versus using a large data center, this is what he's talking about. Um, he already went over this. We don't, I don't need to re repeat that. Um, I always like to go back. I mean, I'm a little bit of a historian myself. Some of you may not have any idea who these people are, but they're very important people. So bottom right, Larry Ellison, when he was young and somewhat handsome. Upper left is the room that NASA used to send. Um, that's the computing system they used to go to the moon. Uh, bottom left, everyone knows uh, Wozniak and Woz. But I think the underlooked is the upper right. Those were known as the tra traitorous eight. Those were the people that left Fairchild Semiconductor that actually became Intel and became the chipset that we everybody in the world uses. They took a big risk. And then Bill Gates and obviously Paul Allen. This quote is really important. We all do this. This is a human fallacy. We think that we're going to have flying cars tomorrow and then we give up after five years when it, when it doesn't happen. So all of those people that are saying, well, when BSV, when BSV? I, I don't know, but, but I know that if you build something of value, you can achieve tremendous things in the 10 or 15 or 20 year horizon. For example, Tony Fidel de developed this iPod in 2001. It had a click wheel and it put 10,000 songs in your pocket. Today, we have something that's a thousand times more powerful than that screenshot I showed you about NASA going to the moon. So this wasn't that long. We're talking about a 20 year horizon, basically. So when I think about Bitcoin, now that I've sort of set the, the modality, it, it's, it's not a trading vehicle, it's not arbitrage. There are three things about Bitcoin that it took me three and a half years to learn. Number one, it is a new internet. Number two, it, the, I, I sold enterprise software, so a lot of companies were on-premise, and then they moved to the cloud. And then the third is micropayments, are the things that we've talked, talked about uh, before. And there are a lot of companies out here that do that. So for me, the first one is really important. So um, I, I worked in the search industry as well. And search back in 1999, 2000, 2001 looked a little bit like this. You had, I remember we had a big party and celebrated when we indexed 300 million web pages. Joke, right? So the way a search engine works is it spiders the internet, it crawls data, it creates an index, and then when you search that index, you get a search result. Simple enough. If you go forward to today, um, you, what, you, what you'll see is, you know, there are DuckDuckGo for privacy, Wolfram Alpha for scientific knowledge, but the one I want to highlight is u.com on the top. Search is going away. So what do they do? When you search, even today's Google without AI is just searching index of documents but they have to update that search. So there's always things that get lost. And even the open AI data sets sometimes are a couple of years old. What you is doing now is they're going into sites like Reddit and YouTube and searching the comments section, searching real-time tag data within videos and providing real-time results that are not possible with a static index crawler for a search engine. So the, the reason that Google is doing BARD and it is because they realize that their fundamental business, search business, is at risk. Larry Ellison had a great quote. He said, Sir, he said, Google's a one trick pony. Hell of a trick, right? And to this day, seven, I think 76 plus percent of their revenue in Google is from search. Uh, thank you, Asset Layer and Jack for letting me use this slide. So one of the things that I wanna talk about is when we talk about digital assets, people think of cryptocurrencies. But when you're talking about a digital asset, it's anything. I and mean, you can see the different categories of things out here today. And I've got a Alfa Romeo logo at the top because they did something interesting last year. If you bought an Alfa Romeo car in Europe, they gave you an, a digital twin NFT that you could, I don't know, supposedly use in a game. But they also have a supply chain or an audit trail of purchases, purchase price, 
oil changes services throughout the entire life cycle of that car. So that if you buy an Alfa Romeo, you can just look at this immutable ledger and see that it's been taken care of in the proper way that you expect. These are the kinds of things that I get excited about. So infrastructure is the building block. And you know, I'm an old guy, I've been around. I was in the Valley in 1999 when all this stuff happened. And what happened is there was a big fervor and then there was a crash and Amazon came out of that crash. So anybody recognize this guy? This is a young Mark Andreessen who was the founder of a company called Netscape for you young people was the first browser before any, we used to have to use this thing called Telnet, which was like typing text and getting responses. So he created this, but what a lot of people don't know is that if you ever go to, everybody get a 404 error when you're searching the web and it says it can't be found. Well, 402 was a payment rail. They had a meeting with the server side guys and the front end guys at Netscape in night, I think it was 19, yeah, it was before this. It was 93, I think, 94. They were gonna build a pay rail into the browser because when you open a session in the browser, it identifies who you are, KYC, and it knows what you're trying to do. The session can close. It's You can't get in the middle of it. They were gonna build this, but I don't think the capability was there or they decided not to. So when people people don't understand that if, he, if they made the decision to build this, we wouldn't even be having a conference. We wouldn't be talking about blockchain because this would all be built in in a session certificate that's, that's secure. So one of the fundamental aspects that people misunderstand about blockchain is identity. If you go to the local bodega and you want to buy a bottle of whiskey or a bottle of wine, you give them your ID. They scan your ID. Your name is on it. Your address is on it. Why do they need that data? All they need to know is that you're 21. That's all they need to know. Nothing else. So what's interesting about a blockchain is this identity can be baked into it. And I would, I, in my view, identity is the most important part of a blockchain that people just misunderstand. So if you're doing a transaction for gold with Troy Money, or if you're doing a, a loan, or you're doing a, um, you know, let's just say a bond offering on a municipal level, Knowing who the counterparty is is important, but just like that bottle of wine or whiskey, you don't have to know who they are. You just have to know that they have the money to pay for the thing that they're paying for or who to pay and where to pay. And so I think, I think we're going to see here a lot more about identity as far as blockchain goes. And people, people talk about all sorts of things, but in my view, this is the crux of blockchain. Um, so I'm going to go through the cloud on-prem. So I, I used to sell software to CEOs, and I heard this quote over and over again. It's laughable, I know now, but why would I share my most valuable client data online? Why would I put it in the, in the cloud? And then this guy, I love to pick on him. Um, I guess you get a Nobel Prize for being wrong a lot as an economist. Uh, you know, Paul Krugman, you know, look at, look at this quote. This is what kills me. Metcalf's Law is interesting for those that, you know, you can look at it. It has to do with um, basically LinkedIn. It's the net square, inverse of the square of uh, network effects. Um, well, he was wrong. 96, this is just Microsoft uh, information. 96% of the Fortune, I think it's actually 1,000 or 500 companies are using cloud services today. Uh, Amazon came out with this thing called S3, Simple Compute, EC2. In 2002, they were screwing around with it. They put it out in 2006. It cost about $200 to store a gigabyte of data back then. Again, 20 years. 20 years later, it's 0 0.002 cents to store a gigabyte of data on Amazon. So, so why am I, you know, and, and then if you look at some of the data on this. Today, that revenue, that just AWS, not Amazon, is $80 billion a year run rate this year off of an idea from 2006 whose beta tag wasn't removed till 2009. So 15 years. And, and it's not just Amazon. This is the spending, $200 billion is gonna be spent worldwide on cloud SaaS. And so why am I bringing this up? So when we have a conversation in 2023 about blockchain, this is, reminds me exactly like the movie I saw in 2000. Nobody's gonna put their data in the cloud. The cloud's a fad, they don't trust it. To me, today's blockchain, in 15 years from today, we're going to be saying the same thing about blockchain. So, so, so let's look at it from a public company perspective. So, so you guys may, may have heard about NASA. NASA spent $25 million on uh, Amazon Web Services, but they failed to understand that there were ingress and egress charges. 
So they put all their data in, and then they're like, hey, we need that data to do some compute calculations on the, like, yeah, well, that, well, you ask, like, wait a minute, we've spent our whole budget. Yeah, that was for, that was to put it in. How about to take it out? Oops. Uh, so vendor lock-in is a very real thing. If you, if you run, um, and so what we're seeing now is there are companies now that just extract data from Amazon sh sheerly for compute cycles, and then they throw it away to avoid these costs. And GPDR in Europe, it's a compliance law. So each country ha in the EU has its own individual um, uh, laws around privacy. So for example, if you run a company in France and you want to run data and compute analysis across the region, you can't. It has to be inside of France's walls. Once it leaves the, the border, you're in violation of G and the fines are enormous. So the, the point of having an open public blockchain instead of vendor lock-in within all of these different entities is very important. It, it, I would argue it's critical to running a business. And then I already talked about trust and the trustless aspect. Um, so here's just a small sample. I just, I just found this on, you know, in my email inbox the other day. You know, who cares? Like these are database companies with open, um, um, with open source uh, core kernels. When everyone said open source is, you know, GitHub, it's just for free. It's a hundred billion dollars of company market cap. And a lot of people that aren't in the business probably haven't heard of half of these companies. This is big business. I, this is this is me, so I'm not famous, so I didn't put my name there, but but this is what I truly believe. I think on-prem to cloud is analogous to blockchain to the future of data. And I'm talking just about data. And then the last thing, micropayments, the third thing that I think doesn't get enough attention. We've heard a lot about it today, and we're going to hear more about it. Handcash gave a great, Alex gave a great talk about what's possible with payments. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but when you pay with a credit card, it's not instantaneous. There's not instant settlement. If you buy that latte or that piece of pizza, which is $5 now, by the way, uh, in New York, what happens is there's enough fraud built into the system of the credit card interchange networks that they have a 99% idea that it's okay. So they let the transaction go through, but it doesn't actually settle until 24, 48, 72 hours later. And what we don't want to do is recreate this system on top of a blockchain that's 10 times more powerful. Um, and, and this was mentioned before. So if you run a retail business, every million dollars of retail uh, business that you get, you're paying $30,000 in credit card fees. You can negotiate a little bit on the edges depending upon size, but that's insane. Uh, I'm almost done. Um, and then you, Zach, I think, did this one at the beginning, so I don't need to do it. But imagine if you had nano payments where you could just read an article and not have to subscribe. Why does the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times have a building in Times Square? They don't need it. What if you could, uh, and we're starting to see a little bit of this, but if you use Substack and Medium, you can follow your writer, you can pay them, but you're usually paying a $299, $499 monthly fee. What if you just want to read one or two articles? I went to the University of Michigan. I love Michigan sports. I'd pay uh, The Athletic. I'd, I, I'd pay 20 cents to read an article, but I don't necessarily need to join for six bucks a month. Viewers. I mean, Xfinity is my NPS nightmare on the West Coast. I'm sure I forget what the one is here, but cable companies get the worst scores of any companies on earth because they're horrible to deal with. What if I just want to watch Poltergeist? and scare the hell out of my 12-year-old daughter, or she's the one that actually scares me. Maybe I pay $4, maybe I don't want, and then you look at this bottom here. I have a cable package. I pay for Paramount Plus because I can't be bothered to find it later, and I pay for HBO. You, you pay twice as much for these services. Why can't I just pay for what I want to watch? Investors, we're gonna hear a little bit from uh, DXS later, but the same thing. When you break down payments and you break down the micro scale of these payments, it opens up investing to people that live in Southeast Asia or India that make 200 bucks a month or $40 a month. It opens up all kinds of new commerce and possibility worldwide. And then this, this also came from Jack. You're going to hear from Asset Layer a little later, but this is really interesting. So, so if you go to Roblox or you go to EA, EA, Electronic Arts, or any of the big game companies, what do they do? They get a big building. They hire a bunch of people. They make these artists and all these people work for them. They create a game, and the revenue of the game goes right to the bottom line of the company. Well, what if you're a small game dev, and you wanted to outsource the art, or you wanted to outsource the game engine, build something on Unity, create your own game, and do payments across the way so the artist gets a bit, everybody gets their share of the profits immediately, 
distributed through a BSV system, like a Merkle tree that goes to everyone that contributed. And the one example I love to give is Nike. You know, everyone knows the story of the, the woman who created that swoosh. She got paid $25. Uh, and then and then Haste Arcade, we're going to hear from a little later. Joe, so for example, he's created an arcade where, you know, I don't want to steal his thunder, but but where you play a game, you can actually earn money by playing the game. And you can actually earn money by being a fan of somebody playing the game. Sports, people don't realize that the data, if you include casual gaming, half of the population on planet Earth are gamers. Half. I think it's like 4 billion people. Is that right, Joe? I'm, 3 billion people. Yeah, give or take a billion. Um so, so when you when you start to open up these new models, it, it, it just creates all kinds of new things that have never been here before. And all of this is possible because of this thing we call blockchain. And then one last slide. I'm a big reader. I like to absorb a lot of information. I like to give a lot of information. You can probably tell. Uh, if you haven't read the white paper, do so. This one up on the left, the London Review of Books, it's dated. It's like 10 or 12 years old now, but it's a fascinating read. It's like 20 plus pages. And it talks about the story about Craig Wright's home getting um, uh, invaded in, in Australia. And, and it, it, it's really interesting. It reads like a, a spy thriller. Um, yeah, that's it.